DeFi has been somewhat dead for about two years, right? Yields have been not that good. There were a lot of hacks happening, so it wasn't a nice time to be in. The hacker could immediately drain all funds. Three Ram and the team said, let's infuse points and infrastructure coins into the boring dead DeFi. And DeFi got a resurgence, right? That's the... Nobody cares of stable coin rates today, only as a derivative of ETH, maybe funding rates, right? Maybe that. But people just basically said, okay, DeFi is boring, but now we can get points for a huge potentially infrastructure coin. Crypto is a market which is dominated by tail risk, right? Like for five years, things will be fine. And then one sudden day, there's going to be a black swan event and something major is going to blow up. We invented a very great concept, which is called quotas. And in this case, all people from the pool could check how much money could be used as collateral for any particular other asset. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With the Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any visa accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on chain or a business looking to white label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest years, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high-yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Epicenter. Today, I'm chatting with Ivan and Mikhail from the Gearbox protocol, which is a protocol for composable leverage on Ethereum. Uh, this is a really interesting protocol that extends the scope of how leverage can be used with DeFi protocols in the crypto ecosystem. Ivan and Mikhail, welcome to the podcast. Maybe we can start with uh, your story about how you got into the crypto space and you ended up with the Gearbox protocol. So maybe Ivan was first who joined the crypto space. Uh, to me personally, I participated in different technical events. I'm originally from St. Petersburg and we have a lot of different stuff related to machine learning and so on. And one conference was related to crypto and I was totally inspired with energy and so interesting technical solution I've never heard before. So pretty soon we have a really great uh, group of enthusiasts. It was called like St. Petersburg uh, Blockchain Developers Group. And around 400 developers were there. So we have like each two or three week meetups to discuss new technologies, new stuff and so on. And I really felt in love the tech behind that. We talked more this time in 2017 related to Bitcoin, to Ethereum, to a lot of new things come to scene. So I was actively deep into this stuff. And after that, I participated as many projects and many hackathons in my memory maybe it was around 30 or more and i won a lot of them but the biggest things won in january of 2021 i participated in market made 
I was really close to fail and it looks like it was a night when I should create something and the idea of Gearbox came to my mind. So till 7 o'clock on the morning I was coding, 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 right line by line, test the POC and submit one minute before deadline. And boom, the project became a finalist. And after that, a lot of people start to call me and say, hey, we want this project. We want to use Martian Trading on Uniswap when talking, when you deliver it. And it was really cool. So I have a friend, Il Gis, who knows Ivan. And after that, we team up maybe in a month and started this story. Yeah, so my story is not as romantic. I unfortunately cannot code. My mom gave me birth without any special skills. So I was one of the people DMing from 2017. I was one of the people coming to DMs of developers and asking servant token. So I just continued doing it as a, as a thing. So been in this space since 2018, early days. Uh, was always on the community marketing side. Kind of was like doing part-time jobs back at university. And... Uh, Fast forward, was like an angel investor and whatnot, but basically at some point got tired of just like investing in things because you also want to be involved to an extent. So with Ilgis, as Mikhail mentioned, the third co-founder, we also spotted the project of Mikhail. We spotted Mikhail at the hackathon and we're like, okay, let's call with this guy. Maybe we can invest early. And then fell in love with the idea with what it was contributing to the space. So since then, I think this week or so marks three years together, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, it's three years anniversary, I think so. My longest time ever, I think, in a company. <laughs> or community protocol, however you call it, yeah. That's an interesting story. Hackathons do work in creating protocols and startups. That's interesting. So guys, tell me about the, about the idea, the idea about composable leverage. And yeah, what is it really? Ah, uh, it's a really cool question. Thanks for it. Because we started, I started personally thinking, oh, I want to do something with leverage, like a margin trade. And then I thought, oh, it's pretty hard to attract liquidity if you want to launch something like an exchange. Can I reuse Uniswap protocol and just leverage it up? So the first initial idea during the hackathon, what we mentioned before, was to make a leverage for Uniswap. Next stop, we start talking with Ilgis and Ivan and found that we can easily use it for Yearn to leverage Yearn tokens. And then we found, wow, it's cool. We can leverage everything, not only farms and margin trading. We can use different tokens. And now we are going step by step to make a leverage layer. So the idea here is to be a protocol we should power up different protocols to provide liquidity and make it possible to leverage wherever you want. Yeah, so to add to it, any complex idea, architecture or protocol, those building it always need to know how to distill it down to something very simple, right? For the users and like as a catch of phrase. So three years down the line, we are still on that path. I think we are somewhere in the middle of figuring out a good way to pitch it, but uh, let me try a few different concepts and then see which one clicks the most, right? People sometimes have affiliation and more familiarity with one side of products over another. So one way to see it is like account abstraction with leverage. Gearbox essentially gives you that smart account or call it smart wallet or something else, but with leverage inside it. So you have more capital, like imagine if your MetaMask had 10x the funds, but then you go and operate with other protocols through it. It can be farming, it can be trading, it can be doing some composable delta neutral positions. So that's up to you. So it's really leverage as a credit layer or leverage as a liquidity layer to an extent where trades, farms, everything else, that they don't happen within Gearbox protocol. Gearbox protocol is just that middle layer in between that gives you more money, but everything happens with other protocols. So essentially, that's why I personally fell in love with it at first because... I was investing in many things, okay, not that many things, not like SBF, but let's say many enough to see that everything was granularized. And this was to be like, wow, you can actually focus on one protocol, but be able to tap into different narratives, be able to be always relevant, right? That's one of the hardest things in crypto to be relevant. And when you're building a protocol that is isolated in itself, as soon as the narrative switches, you have the issue that you are kind of stuck in something that people don't care about, right? 
And I was like, okay, Gearbox is something I can actually dedicate full time to because if there is something new, you can always see how to edit. Uh, before jumping ahead, of course, that's one of the things we've added recently that we've seen success. So uh, the goal is to make an engine and then adapt to different things that the market wants. So the way kind of I see Gearbox, and correct me if wrong, no, is now in the traditional economy, like TradFi economy, I can get leverage. And usually that leverage is kind of earmarked for a specific purpose. So when I go to the bank for a housing loan, home loan, that's a form of leverage. I might be putting down $200,000 and the bank $800,000. So I'm levering a 4x to buy a home with the home as collateral itself. But those $800,000 that the bank gives can only be used to buy the home and like do repairs to the home. You, can, you cannot use it for anything else. And it's very similar for like auto loans or, or you know, anything like basically other forms of leverage. Now, in the in TradFi, there is like another part of the spectrum where I can take a fully collateralized loan. I go to the bank and give them gold and I get less than that value of gold as a loan. And then I have like full independence. So if I if I do full collateralization like that, probably I can do whatever I want with that with that money because the bank has the gold it has the collateral itself. And then finally in in TradFi you have like this kind of loan which is like the personal loan where which is usually very small amounts of capital only where I can go and get a loan from the bank and I'm free to do whatever I want and I may not even need to put a lot of collateral up and in reality it is being collateralized by me people's earnings power or their or their credit rating or something like that. So that's kind of like the whole range in, in TradFi. So if you go full collateralized, of course you have freedom to do whatever you want, but that's not interesting. That's not leverage actually. You're not really leveraging if it's full collateral. So leverage occurs when you have less than the total amount of capital. But if you have less than the total amount of capital, it's usually going to be in TradFi that you can only use it for certain small purposes because that's how the system is designed. And now in crypto, when we move to crypto, the, the interesting thing is that the role of the bank in a sense is replaced by a protocol where there are so many different primitives that can be accessed inside Ethereum itself, like from Uniswap to Eigenlayer to li liquid staking, etc. Unlike a bank which only may, might be dealing with home loans, Ethereum might be dealing with like hundreds of different instruments. And so what you're trying to do is have a protocol where I can put up some capital X, can get leverage on it like 4x or 5x or 10x the amount of capital. And then I could deploy it not into just one, like one system, but like a mix of various systems depending on on my choice. So it's it's about bringing the freedom to do a lot more on Ethereum because fundamentally Ethereum is a composable machine in a way that TradFi systems are not. You are correct. And just to explain, so basically maybe, as I definitely believe in crypto, we should not copy narratives from the real world I've seen a lot of projects who try to copy existing products from Web 2 to Web 3, and majority of them were unsuccessful. So Gearbox, it's a novice approach to solve this problem. And the idea here may be a little bit similar to credit cards. So our credit accounts could be considered as a credit card. You open it once, and then you can go across different protocols and use this credit account as a smart contract wallet to many of them. When you go to Uniswap, you immediately get margin trading because on your smart contract wallet, there are two sources of funds. The first part, your pound funds. You should provide around 10 person or so to get leverage. And then your credit account could immediately take money from the pool. So when you really open a position you provide, for example, 100 USDC and 900 USDC comes from the pool. 
Now you have 1000 and of course this smart contract wallet has some limitations. For example, you can't withdraw money all of them into your pocket because it's creating solvency for the protocol. But you can consider Gearbox as a lot of different boxes. And let's label each box with a token. For example, we have a box called USDC, we have a box called ETH, LINK, and so on and so on. So when you do any operation between tokens, for example, you make a swap on Uniswap, you put some box USDC and get some tokens to the box of ETH. Or if you go to provide some liquidity to the farm, you take some USDC tokens and get some URN tokens. After each operation, we go across these boxes and compute your collateral. And if we really compare this collateral with your debt and it's bigger than debt, operation could be considered as safe and okay. If not, it's reverted. It's why we protect pools from and protocol from insolvency. So each time you participate and interact with third party protocol, you really provide some tokens out of the credit account and get some new tokens. And then we compute collateral. Pretty clear. And furthermore, in V2, we have a really great experiment feature. You can connect Gearbox protocol through the wallet connect to external protocol. For example, to Uniswap and have a really native experience. So you shouldn't learn how to use Gearbox application. You can simply connect to Uniswap, then do swaps as usual, and Gearbox automatically make all routing and so on to create native experience. And probably in the future, I believe we also could implement such things. Thanks for credit abstractions and create amazing product when people should not learn what Gearbox is, we want to become a part of infrastructure. So it's like a credit card. You never keep into your mind how it works when I paid for a milk in a shop. Gearbox could be the same. You have a special Gearbox wallet. You have 10x money. And then you go to Uniswap or Curve or LIDA, wherever you want. And just use them with X10 money. Pretty cool, I think. Nothing I would add specifically. I would just say you started with don't copy the narratives from Web 2 to Web 3. I think what you probably so meant, don't copy the implementation of the products people might want, right? So you kind of just do them the same way. And that gets back to Mihir's point where he said that uh, oh, like you can get a loan to do anything, right? But it cannot be large size and it is guaranteed by your earnings. So there is things like somebody coming to your house to beat you up to get your money back, right? Like let conceptually... That's how they work in real world, right, to an extent. There is also the concept of digital identity that needs to be maintained. While in crypto, you have a bunch of different addresses conceptually, right? So you cannot copy this leverage, right, this loans at a larger amount than you initial in crypto the same way. The pro As Mikhail said, and fully agree with him there, if you try to copy that fully, you just don't arrive anywhere because your rails are fully different. So you need to adapt. Maybe the narrative is similar to like prime brokerage in real world, but the implementation is absolutely different. And that's what we see with many successful products, right? Like from, I guess, okay, let's not go that far uh, for now. Uh, but yeah, as Mikhail said, you get, like essentially we supercharge your wallet with X5, X10, the amount of money. And then all of the trades, farms, positions, whatever you do, like a credit card, they happen elsewhere. Uh, and that's the composability part, right? You can margin trade on Uniswap, you can leverage farm on Curve, Lido, uh, convex uh, balancer, right, wherever else it is, or you could leverage restake, which is the hottest narrative in town this week's, right, or this month. So, uh, yeah. So yeah, l let's cover let's cover this hottest uh, hottest narrative now. Maybe like leverage restake is already quite complex. Let's first think of like leverage stake. So I'm able to leverage stake with Gearbox. What is it, and like, what could I get? What kind of returns could I get? through, through, through this, these strategies. Uh, let me start this one and then Mikhail can catch up and tell what I missed. So a leverage staking conceptually is pretty, pretty old strategy, right? Aave had it, uh, Instadap had it on top of Aave and so on. The point there was, well, you have a few different ways to get to leverage staking position, right? One way is when you have Delta neutral. So you don't have like a long or short on ETH compared to USDC. 
you just have ETH, right? And you want more of ETH. You don't, you don't want to care about the volatility of the ETH price, right? Those are essentially the strategies that have been popular on Aave and pretty much any other lending protocol. Uh, with that, what, what the position is really about is you arbitrage the rate between vanilla ETH borrow, right? So normal ETH that you borrow and the staking yield that let's say Lido or some other staking provider like Rocket Pool gives you, right? And then you loop it. So what you do is you essentially borrow ETH, right? You put it into ST ETH, swap and go back. That's just the looping, right? The usual strategy everybody is familiar with. But Gearbox, that strategy also worked and got very popular. I think around $30 million worth of ETH deposited into Lido directly module back in V2, which was last year. Uh, but it was done differently. So in Gearbox, you don't do the looping like in Ava, for example, right? You have almost two pools, right? You just borrow between them and you loop. In Gearbox, you take X5 the money at the beginning, right? In your credit account. And then you do, for example, that swap or LIDAR deposit with that amount of money fully altogether. You can do it in tranches or you can do it all together. So the difference here is your execution and your yield is exogenous. It's not about just arbitraging the rates within one protocol. It's about doing all of that rate composability among different protocols and which ones those are. That depends on you as a user and, of course, whatever integrations are enabled. Today, people might be earning 3.5% APY on, on Lido, on average, right? So if I had, for simplicity's sake, 100 ETH, well, that's a lot of money now. So if I had 100 ETH, I could open essentially like a wallet, uh, credit account with, uh, with Gearbox protocol. If I deposit the 100 ETH in there, I might be able to get up to 1,000 ETH from the from the gearbox protocol itself i may even choose lesser i might choose to take lesser 500 400 whatever so let's say i take 400 so 100 of my own and 400 from the protocol 500 now when i deposit the 500 into lido it gets deposited as eat and it starts to on on interest so so basically with 100 i would have made 3.5 ETH per year, assuming 3.5% stays for the year. But with 500 ETH, it, it is as if uh, my position is making 3.5 multiplied by 5. So that's something like 17.5% E by staking on, on Ethereum, which is like a pretty safe operation. And on the other side, because I've borrowed this 400 ETH, I, uh, I need to pay some kind of interest to the protocol and if that is less than 17.5 percent then kind of like it's a it's a worthwhile trade is that right i think you're right but i want to have some addition what really made gearbox different because we focused in your example just to get yield from the state ease and it's critical strategy it's very common but gearbox has unique feature as i mentioned before you have a lot of boxes why you should keep your STEs on account it generate not enough yield let's put it into curve and get curve token c i forgot i think it's like here the is or so and then put this curve token in the convex position to get more yield. It's doable, and it's why Gearbox have a big difference with our or other protocols. We are fully composable. So basically, you start, let's go and follow your example. You have 100 ETH. You go to Gearbox and say, hey, I have 100 ETH. I want X for leverage. Now you have 500 ETH. For simplicity, let's consider that all rates are one-to-one, -one, so you swap 500 ETH into 500 stake ETH. Pretty cool, you already get some interest rate. But it's not enough for you. You put your 500 STEs into Cure to get, for simplicity, 500 CRVE, and then you put it in the convex position, so you really make it boosted position. You make yields from ETHs, you made some rewards from Cure, and it's a quite unique for Gearbox because your own, your own credit account, 
we should not really follow for complexity when people use like an old design of pools in our own money or in elder all money located into the pool which creates a honeypot for hackers and it's hard to compute your separate position in gearbox when you open credit account 500 is on a dedicated smart contract and if convex want to pay rewards this rewards will be transferred on your credit account we should not take all this complex math how to spread them for all pool owners because it's a pretty complex task for computation each protocol should have a different cure schedules and so on and as a result if you use like a pool design things it would be hard to really make all computation and at the end provide uh, the real rewards in gearbox your convex position behaves to your credit account so all extra rewards which could be paid in different token all the yours it's really good so you can make STEs in convex and then you can get LDO token if I remember correctly or something else as an additional reward which creates more and more juicy rates for you so you know that sounds that sounds really amazing, right? Because I could stake and participate in a curve pool and maybe something else altogether with Gearbox, earning uh, more and more interest with every cycle, every additional thing in which I participate. So one of the one of my worries, and maybe like we can cover that later in the in the episode, is when users start to use, let's say, three different smart contract systems with Gearbox. Let's say you're using Curve, Lido, maybe like something else. Then isn't it the case that even if like one of these protocols gets hacked and their ETH gets stolen. So there's a smart contract risk with Lido, smart contract risk with Curve, and maybe there's the third thing is Yearn. There's a smart contract risk with Yearn. Any of these systems blow up, all of that bad credit then lands up on the table of gearbox because th that ETH cannot be retrieved anymore. Not so. So I think like this is this is kind of like one of my conceptual questions. Maybe for now or either for the future. That how do you actually can you even keep a protocol like gearbox safe when smart contract hack risk is so major in our ecosystem? I think it's a really great question because I'm really crazy and focused on safety and uh, our devs really a little bit hate me because I ask them right fast and do audits and so on because we want to make it as safe as possible. And Gearbox in comparison with this many other protocols I know has a totally different safety model. Just imagine and let's compare with Euler or Awe, which based on or Morpho, it's the same on this pool model. In these protocols, you have a pool when you have ease and STEs, for example. And all time, all users interact with this pool. So if a hacker, potentially hacker, could be able to do something with this pool, the hacker could immediately drain all funds what happens with Euler and it was up to 200 millions. Another part that this pool design really likes to have unused money because it increases TVL. If you go and check some pools in Ava, you can find that the, some of them has a very low utilization. It's around maybe 5%. So a lot of money just light some lay some money uh, somehow somewhere and do not generate additional things gearbox has a totally different security model at the first time as you already mentioned all money come to the pools so when passive lenders comes to gearbox they provide with their liquidity to the pool however you as a leverage user or needs could not access to these funds directly. Instead of then, when you open credit account, 
we transfer this money from the pool into dedicated smart contract. And then only you as a user could manage them through the our security system. What implications for security of such model? It's a very easy. When we have a high utilization, it means that initial pool of 100 million will be really uh, spread it across maybe 100 smart contracts. And each smart contract which held around 1 million in different assets, correct? At this case, if you're a hacker who want to really steal money from the pool, your honeypot is limited because it's if we go through the high utilization around 90 person, it means that you can't borrow so much because for more security, we have a special buffer on the top of utilization, which allow users who are on the B side to withdraw money. So basically, if we have like a free 5 million of available money to borrow. And if you're a hacker, you can own and you can find uh, some security hole. I hope we have now them, but you never could be confident, yeah? You can really borrow up to 5 million to this thread and steal them because all other money are spread across different wallets. It's a totally different security model. And we want to be to make a gearbox is a very capital efficient. We are not willing to keep to keep like a stale money on the pools because they create this honeypot. For ease now in this risk-taking company, it looks like our utilization 90%. So if you come today as potential hacker and want to borrow, there is nothing to borrow for you. We really go through the limits and it's create a very good stuff. However, as you mentioned previously, if, of course, some protocol, when we provide money, could be hacked, of course, it create bad debt. But the same problem in our way, if you use STEs or Curve token as collateral and the protocol would be hacked, the same risk. Agreed? If you look at Gearbox itself, right? So you have a bunch of um, sort of passive lenders putting in putting in capital and then you have a bunch of people uh, on different side of the market which is like taking leverage and then putting them into into a set of protocols and maybe there are like 15 or 20 different integrations maybe in the future there are 100 integrations uh, that your that your protocol has and yes the system can be financially designed the system is financially designed in a way that if those counterparty protocols you are, which, with which you are integrated, if they are safe, your entire system will run safely and it will be pretty hard to hack into. But in crypto, like, you know, it's... Like, crypto is a market which is dominated by tail risk, right? Like, for five years, things will be fine. And then one sudden day, there's going to be a black swan event and something major is going to blow up, like Terra USD is going to blow up. I think like these, when I look at these DeFi protocols in Ethereum, they have they have a similar nature, right? If you make, like, if you make 15 integrations, every five years, you are going to have an event where two or three of these integrations that you have are going to blow up in the same week. And they are all going to like go to zero for for some reason, right? Like either the money gets stolen because of some some smart contract vulnerability that two two systems share or something like that. And it feels to me that like that is something that is very hard to defend against for Gearbox for anything that is offering leverage in a in a smart contract environment. Yes, and uh, we do step by step things to protect users. So basically, mm, if we consider Gearbox from the business perspective, you can find the Gearbox, and maybe I think it's a very good model comes from Web two in terms of narrative. Here we have a passive lenders, and it looks like a deposit in a bank so you won't just to get money and not focusing 
on details. For example, I am really the worst trader ever. If I buy any token or any asset, it's immediately going down. And so basically, and as opposite, so you can really do it in different way and make a lot of money. So I prefer to be on a passive side. And of course, there are some people who have some great skills and experience who can trade and so on and so on on the leverage side. And in this case, it's a quite simple way to find the equilibrium between these two parts. We invented a very great concept, which is called quotas. And in this case, all people from the pool could check how much money could be used as collateral for any particular other asset. For example, just imagine we have this ETH pool and we have a quota how much money could be invested into Renzo protocol for restaking. Now the quota is around 15k ETH. So basically the system accounts that not more than 15k of ETH could be used as collateral in any way. So all potential losses are fixed. And in the way how other companies or farms build their portfolio, they could have like a blue chip with higher limits. For example, it's a pretty safe today, as we know, to invest money into Bitcoin related to a smart contract or technical problem. Yeah, we trust the system or ease. It's also a great example of a very stable system. In this case, for example, if you open a long position from USDC, the quota limit for ease could be very, very high. However, for all risky assets, which could generate a lot of ease, we can set a lower limit. And in this case, it's create a good combination. Me, as a passive lender, could check, wow, this 60% of the pool could be used only for safe tokens when the risk of the smart contract program is quite low. And this 40% could be spread across different small protocols, which could generate high yields. But for each protocol, the limit is set, for example, up to a, up to a few million. And the logic here is how maybe venture funds works. They try to invest in many, many, many startups. Some of them could fail, but as a result, another one could generate so many, so much money that they really cover bad debt and so on. Of course, we have a lot of risk models, consideration, and when analysts, our quants compute how to set up these limits and so on, they do so their job to really eliminate all potential risks. However, as you can see, of course, smart contract risks exist, but it's limited. It also exists across different protocols, and we try to add additional things to really detect it before and do some steps. It's really in our backlog to protect more and more. So, of course, our main goal to make Gearbox the safest one for these investments. Let me just add one thing. I think the comparison with venture capital isn't exactly the right one there. Even though the logic makes sense, the comparison is that venture capital has downside, right? They can just go to zero. Many of them do. With Gearbox, the point is it's more comparison with the bank where they say you're allowed to do a loan, for example, 5% for the real estate market in New York, right? But only 0.5% for Detroit, for example. So that way you cap them. And let's say if liquidations occur, there are things like LTV being lower, right? There are things like monitoring systems. So if an asset has a shortfall, if that's the right word, it is conceptually that Gearbox would liquidate it before lenders have any downside exposure. So the idea is, of course, that lenders never lose their money unless a huge hack occurs. And then you have things like reserve funds stepping in, whether it's enough to cover or not is one question, right? Before the reserve fund even steps in, there are things like liquidator premium and other things where MEV sophisticated bots, because it's a fully open system, right? They can liquidate the position before, let's say, some idle holders from another protocol are able to do so, right? So there are a few different steps. I think getting back to a question, Michael, on once every five years, something blows up, right? 
you know, that's something that blows up is a Lido, for example. I don't think any amount of security modules are going to do anything, right? Mikhail, you can beat me up here, but I don't think we're able to do anything with that. So if it's one of the most safe pieces failing, that's one thing, right? If it's the tail risk, which are new stuff, for tail risk, we have these quotas and limits of the protocol. And uh, coming back to Mikhail's point of Gearbox being secure due to being this, like, you know, having many different pieces, uh, I buy into this story. But of course, we don't anyhow hate Aave, Euler, right? Ajna, Morpho, and others. They're all great teams. But we, of course, are biased thinking that the w design we have is better. End of the day, though, I think all of these protocols are moving towards a model where there is more granularization, right? So there are different pieces, risk is isolated, risk is priced differently. It's just the question of whether you have uh, one system with a lot of modules in it, right? Or you have fully separate modules and one system uniting them all together then. And that's where lending protocols or lending mechanics disagree. Uh, because one thing is maybe safer from one perspective, but then it's unusable, right? Another one is more usable, but then it packs a bit more inside. So we can have that debate forever. Yeah, but but on on a high level, I, on a high level, the idea is that yes, like when you do a lot of integrations as a composable leverage protocol, you are exposed to the risks, the smart contract risks in like the counterparty systems that you are integrating. But you have this system of quotas where you're probably assigning higher quotas to safer systems or systems that have lasted in the wild for a longer run, like Ethereum staking itself or Lido, and then smaller quotas for the very new DeFi protocol that might be offering 40% yields. And the hope is, or the engineering design problem now is to adjust these quotas well so that the protocol survives and does well in the long run without harming the passive lenders of the, the protocol. That makes sense, right? Like that's probably the limit of what engineering can achieve in a, in a market like that. And it seems that people argue that you have like an Aave-like model, right? Where you essentially, it is bootstrapped and then they can integrate new things and then you can use different stuff, right? Gearbox probably is a bit more... Mikhail, would it be fair to say it's a bit more similar to Aave than to other lending protocols? So you would say... Not a fair comparison. Uh, I think we are in the middle between uh, lending protocol, mid curve, lending protocols like Awe, because the initial pool design I was inspired by Awe in 2021. I really learned the concept from them, and we similar in the pool design. However, these quotas and the way how we spread money from credit accounts are quite unique, and in this case. I think maybe we are a little bit similar how sexes work. So, for example, when you use Kraken, you have a special smart contract when you deposit your money for this exchange or withdrawal. And basically, the same logic in Gearbox. So, we have a separated credit account for each person. It's a quite unique. I think maybe some teams try to copy, but it's... a uh, pretty complex concept to be implemented, but it's safer. So it's like risks in any system, right? So, sorry, one thing. Like in society, in technology, right? Uh, I don't know why I am saying this. I have the least experience out of all the people now in the podcast. But the thing there is you either have like some level of aggregation, right? Which makes it easier for users and anybody interacting. Of course, that introduces a bit of bottleneck and a bit of not centralization risk, but more like some level of something occurring there. Or you have full-on permissionlessness, but then you have to bootstrap every single time from zero. And the middle ground, right, is what we are trying to make in the best way possible. Another part, sorry, a, sm a few words. So Gearbox, just to imagine, it's a very, very modular system. And now we talk a little bit that there are some pools when lenders could deposit their money as a passive side. And... They are connected to a entity which is called Credit Manager, which really holds on policies related to what you can do and not. And then a lot of credit accounts connected to Credit Manager. So it's like one to many, one to many. So one pool could have connected different credit managers, and each credit manager has a lot of credit accounts. It's like a tree. 
And from the passive side, it's a quite easy. We have a clear list which protocols or tokens uh, could be used uh, in these credit managers. And in quotas, you can check, wow, this pools has such limits for these assets. But without any line of code, we can create, because it's modular, more complex stuff. For example, we can create a few pools for USDC. Why not? One of them could be called like a conservative one. And we can allow to use money from this pool only for blue chips. It would have better safety measurements because the lift of the protocols are very, very safe, like ease, BTC, and so on. And another pool is opposite. We can call it a risky one or juicy one or digging one. And these funds from this pool could be used across new DeFi protocols. And in this case, you as a passive side could choose between these two pools. If you want to focus on safety, you can use more conservative one. If you can take into account that risk is possible or one of these tokens could have some problems in the future, but the yields look so lucrative, you can provide your passive liquidity to this pool. So it's create a modularity and in this case, Gearbox, without any additional line of code, could, we can build a lot of different projects. So margin trading, leverage farming, leverage restaking. We can simply build a lending market just from different modules to make them properly configured. Cool. Okay. So, yeah, quota limits for, for the protocol and then for the pools are like two ways by which like you can sort of like adjust risk and like there, there are different pools that offer can offer different riskiness and they the different pools can have different integrations and that is how you know like different kind of flavors of risk i guess can be can be created in the protocol now actually coming back to the leverage restaking so recently like a, a lot of Attention in Twitter has gone to your new leveraged restaking products. And uh, yeah, could you explain what the, what leveraged restaking is and like why why people are kind of interested in this strategy? DeFi has been somewhat dead for about two years, right? Yields have been not that good. Uh, there were a lot of hacks happening, so it wasn't a nice time to be in. Uh, I guess for builders like Mikhail, who sit in the dungeon and code is good. No, no, like nobody calling you asking servant token. For me, it gets less, less good because I have to see everybody being upset, right? Like, sir, when is DeFi reviving? Anyway, at some point, eigenlayer, uh, l let's put aside all of the DA availability, right? The data availability and other stuff. Let's talk about what's relevant for us. The eigenlayer part of restaking. Sri Ram and the team said, let's make, let's infuse points and infrastructure coins into the boring dead DeFi. And DeFi got a resurgence, right? That's the, nobody cares of stable coin rates today, only as a derivative of ETH, maybe funding rates, right? Maybe that. But people just basically said, okay, DeFi is boring, but now we can get points for a huge potentially infrastructure coin. And that made the borrow yields insane because people, that's one thing to farm, that's one thing to pre-farm when you don't know what you pre-farm, right? That's another thing to pre-farm points that you don't even know at what ratio are going to be there for what you were going to get, at what valuation, at what supply, right? Full on, absolutely gamble from the people who want it. But people made valuation sheets and said, this is going to cost dozens of billions. So I'm going to pay a huge amount of borrow to get more ETH today to leverage restake. So LIDAR rates today, uh, 3.5, as you said yourself, right? And then they said, okay, uh, this is going to be whatever. It's going to be multiples of that. Uh, fully based on people's expectations. But because of the expectations that gave resurgence to DeFi, because now people are prepared to borrow vanilla ETH or even LIDO e ST ETH, right? At a huge rates, because they expect this airdrop to be worth a lot. So all the previous talk we just had for the past half an hour about composability, rates, granularization, right? All of that. That is all an engine to enable integrations which the market wants. And we saw that one is the one that market really wants. Uh, as soon as the LR, as soon as the 
possibility to leverage eigenlayer yield uh, points, sorry, not yields even, they're points, right? Came to life, we integrated it. There were a couple of things why we couldn't do it earlier is because eigenlayer has a seven day withdrawal window and for lending protocols, unless you modify the logic, you need to be able to withdraw immediately, right? To be able to withdraw immediately, you need liquidations to work immediately. And there was no secondary market to have the seven day withdrawal window be capped, right? To let's say a minute, okay, a second really. So then came LRT protocols, liquid restaken tokens. Uh, I think that's EtherFi, Renzo, Kelp, and a few other, uh, Puffer, right? And a few others essentially. They said, okay, we're making derivatives. So basically it's a, they made their own ST ethers, but for restaking, right? Conceptually pretty much the same uh, for the user. Behind it, of course, it's some AVSs, right? Figuring out what operator you are, which AVSs you service, where the yields come from, all of that people don't care. They see a new STETH, but they think it's going to yield 30%. And because of that, they pay 25% today. That's pretty much it. So the protocols that capitalize on giving leverage to it were Pendle and Gearbox, essentially. I'm not sure there is anything else. I know there is a Wales market, which is like an OTC platform to literally buy and sell points with some collateral. But that's basically like a centralized exchange, right? You pay for points at a certain price. That's like no like mechanics there per se. Uh, with Pendle, you split your yield between the uh, principal and the yield token, right? And then you just loop it. With Gearbox, you get more vanilla ETH, and then you shag it all into EtherFi, Renzo, and other integrations available. So there's the resurgence of DeFi. The borrow rate they're prepared to pay depends on how much they expect the airdrop to be, right? The airdrop depends on how much percentage of airdrop Eigenlayer is going to give an airdrop which they have never even promised a token yet, right? There are so many dependencies of people expecting stuff in this case, it's crazy, but hey, we are protocol, we service what the market needs as long as it's safe. Is it safe? Well, those are just LRTs, right? They have hundreds of millions of dollars of liquidity on Balancer, Uniswap, right, Curve, and whatever else. So who are we to judge? We service the user if it's within safety and so far it seems to be pretty vanilla safe. Um, I'll shut up at this point. I think that's probably enough. I'll let Mikhail add whatever I missed uh, on that front. Yeah, and as a part, what I really like in all these things, because it's amazing stuff in terms of safety. These poems exist only as all of us in Web3 likes on Postgres or somewhere centralized database. And at this point, because this point is something ephemeral, we do not take into account when we compute collateral. So basically, we know that each eigenlayer is could be swapped somehow to real is. So it has a great collateral. We should not take into account all future or expected profits when you really measure the value. So it's a quite safe because. I can see we can grow very, very high until we know this all money comes from Gearbox will be staked to real ease in Eigen layer, and it's safe because there is no promises, there is nothing like this uh, token could cost like 1.2 ease, no additional stuff. And of course, these points could be beneficial, but it's a quite cool, and as Ivan said, Gearbox now is one of good information uh, providers how people measure and expect how much money they could get. If they are willing to pay so high rates to borrow this yield, it means they have a really high expectation and you can really use Gearbox stats to understand the real, the real pricing for these points and so on. So pretty cool, pretty cool. I really like it. It's absolutely crazy. A friend of mine who was like bearish the entire time, he's like pretty whale, but he was like, no, this is all risky. He is now looking at Gearbox interface every second day, just shagging hundreds of Ethereum into leverage because he is saying this is the future. Like we went from buying companies with companies of with cash flow, right? To ICOs in 2017, which made promises, to then ICOs without any promises, to then absolutely vaporware stories without any tech, to now, to then, farming tokens, right? And future airdrops without knowing what they are. To now farming points for future airdrops, not knowing what they are. 
And now people are making liquid tokens of the points, which give you tokens then. So I don't know how much more this can go. And it doesn't actually, so <laughs> none of this is bad for security, right? Because these are people's expectations for profits. They don't, as Mikhail said, they don't care for collateral value. The only thing they care for is that people are prepared to pay more higher today in real genuine assets compared to what's going to be tomorrow. So it's not like, you know, it's not that, it's not like Luna where you have tail risk of that stuff, right? None of these points are ever calculated anywhere. You only have one new thing, which is the derivative, the LRT itself, right? And those are pretty straightforward. Like that's basically the business you run, right? Just with a bit more stuff that you need to do on top. As the smart contracts go, there is nothing conceptually new. So when people compare restaking to Luna Collapse, like at some point, no, this is just like a couple of staking contracts, right? And that's pretty much it. All of the craziness is just expectations and smart contracts don't care of what you expect. Like they are not anyhow valued into, you know, future value or collateral or anything else. It's just people are just prepared again to pay more today than they're going to get tomorrow because they think tomorrow is going to be brighter. And that's fine. That's what we are here for as a market service, essentially. Right. So this is this is actually like a a signal of a bull market to come that I, I totally agree with you, Ivan, right? Like so if you look at the system itself, you are dealing with eigenlayer and like these restaking liquid restaking systems, which per se are not very complex smart contract systems, right? Like their complexity is off off Ethereum. Their complexity is not on Ethereum itself, the part you're dealing with. But it's 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 really the case that Eigenlayer is promising or like some like Eigenlayer is giving some kind of points if you restake with Eigenlayer today. When you restake with Eigenlayer, there is actually nothing that is done with that capital in the here and now. Nobody knows exactly what these points are worth, whether they will convert to a token, one token or two tokens or zero tokens or not. But still, the market is kind of expecting it to get converted into a token and for that token to be extremely valuable. So much so valuable that it's fine to borrow ETH at 20% from Gearbox Protocol. And this is like the clearest sign of a bull market that probably probably we can see, we can see around, right? Like I've, I've actually come across. That's really, that's really cool. And yeah, I think like Gearbox Protocol will do well in, in, in that, particular, that particular market. So now one of my curiosities is, you know, like when I look at something like Gearbox Protocol, where like first of all, when I am kind of, let's say I'm a passive lender, I lend passively to a pool and I must get an interest rate. On the, on the other side, if I am, I'm taking leverage, I must pay an interest rate. So something has to set the interest rate. But it's not just the interest rate, like... Earlier in the conversation, we talked about how you need different kinds of um, quotas to determine how the how much risk to allocate to each integration that Gearbox protocol does. So there are like all of these parameters to be set into the protocol for it to run well. And so how, how does that work? How does the governance of this system work? I can start to make that complex picture of this quota system and how we really uh, develop them step by step in our minds. And then Ivan can talk more about DAO and how the voting works. So the initial idea was, okay, we are really worrying about if someone could invest a key or some readers could invest during like a hype cycle invest a huge part of the pool in some risky asset and then it could be a black swan event, the asset becomes zero and we can get bad debt. Okay, the next point was, wow, we want to limit the possibility. We think, guys, you could not use more than the quota limit into some particular asset. Looks good. After that, we keep up in mind, okay, if we have a limited possibility, to use some pool funds into some particular asset, which could generate very high yields, it's create a shortage, it's create a higher demand, because you as a needless, at this case, should really be the first to use this opportunity, correct? 
So it's a way that we should really increase the price of using these pool funds to this particular asset. Otherwise, it would be like first come, first take. And in terms of small quotas, it would be unfair things. And we create a quota interest rate and gauges. The concept is a very, very simple. We are not willing to be uh, people who, make, who really provide the idea this asset should be priced or this should be additional interest of 5% or 10% and so on. Because it's a crazy mess, it's a lot of work and it doesn't fit the market needs. You can't predict it. Instead of that, we create a very clear system called gauges. So each asset has a quota limit and at the same time it has a mean rate which is computed based on security model. So for example, we can understand that probably the additional value that NISA should pay in original collateral value. So we do not keep into account how much the price of uh, end asset we really talk all time for the underlying asset. So if you want to use ease from the pool for this restating, you should additionally pay 15 or 20 percent more. And this amount adds to the base interest rate from the pool. And then there is some minimum rate and maximum rate. It's a maximum possible profits we expect for such an asset. And then people could stake their gear tokens and what for minimum side or maximum side. So basically it creates a great market equilibrium. If you're LP, it's so natural that you go to gauges, take your gear and what to maximize your profits. Correct? Because when the interest rate going up, it means you earn more. If you a media, it's so good to go to the gauges and what to reduce the interest rate because when the interest rate for any particular token you have position is lower, you make more money. So you stake on both sides and it's what we call gear wars. And there are some interesting cases. For example, if you compete for the liquidity, you can really want to lower interest rates for your protocol and increase rates for a competitive one. It's also pretty cool for us. And in this case, because we have a very, very flexible system, as a result, different parts could agree what is the market equilibrium. If the additional quota rate will be very, very high, nobody wants to borrow and keep these assets. It's unprofitable. And in this case, all people who stay here do it for nonsense here. At the opposite side, it's a quite low. There is no big demand to uh, liquidity to the pool. So it's a way how we can really found the real market price. A lot of people could vote for different stuff, uh, different, different two parts to reduce or increase this rate. And as a result, the gauges is the way how they could make the final decision. What is the market equilibrium? And I think it's a very good model because all stakeholders could agree using gauges. What is the real additional price for this risk, for this particular asset, for this community? Just to summarize, so... If I'm borrowing some asset from a pool and I want to put it into some integration like Eigenlayer or Uniswap, if I'm borrowing ETH for maybe Uniswap LPing, I have one interest rate. And if I'm borrowing it for the Eigenlayer, I have a different interest rate. Now, this interest rate, there is some minimum amount that is like set by the protocol, but then there's a variable amount for these different applications. And how is the variable amount set? The variable amount is set by the holders of the gear token, which is the token of the gearbox protocol, and they can stake their gear and they can essentially participate in this decision making of the interest rate setting. And your underlying assumption in this, in this system is that because the gear holders have a stake in the system, that collectively they will set the interest rates intelligently enough that 
they don't set it too low that there's too much market demand and too little supply or too high such that there's very little demand and too much supply so you are you're banking on the token holders to collectively make this kind of assessment and and do it yeah you are correct and just consi- just consider an example because we talked a lot today about leverage with staking it was fun because these gauges we believe of course more people will be involved when tvl will be more than even now but when the people found wow it's cool to really use gearbox for restaking we add all the e's and we e's and then we found that people immediately understand the concept and they start voting to lower the price so it works by epoch so the interest rate sets for a whole week and it's changed each monday so basically during the week you can vote to increase or decrease it and the latest value before epoch change it happens on 12 gmt on monday will be used for the whole next week so each week we has update like a curve and we recognized wow we do not really talk more about the system but people immediately recognized and lower the interest rate for the quotas close to zero or so because they understand that and then another part wow i wrote a tweet and some of them recognize that zero interest rate is too low and wants to really make it higher so basically it's going back and forth and now i believe it's around 50 or 20 percent even maybe you have uh, latest numbers yeah yeah around there does this system work in practice uh how long has it been live and do you actually believe this will scale to billions of dollars so there is an interesting discussion on this some people believe free market should be free without absolutely any like anybody tweaking the rates and whatever right real world economics have a bunch of people trying to tweak rates whether that works or not is a question right like with those interest rates of the powell right and all the memes of the last three years and the steamy checks right all of that let's put that a bit aside and see that gauges thing as a bootstrap and incentive layer so it's not even about to make the system perfect and because we think gear stakers are amazing at a much better at finding rates than the free market is right usually free markets humble everybody it's more so a layer that helps bootstrap new integrations and the layer that helps funnel liquidity in different ways so see it as an extra engine that helps the system work rather than something that tries to replace the free market conceptually the system should to an extent try to relate to the free market if there are any other opportunities and protocols offering similar right so it's not like we are trying to change free market it's more so that let's say three liquid restaking protocols are added they all battle for liquidity and let's say gearbox has that liquidity they're going to be incentivized to either give points or they even own tokens liquid right bribes essentially for the rates for their own protocol to be lower lenders on the other side who we envision to be not just let's say smaller passive investors but rather protocols themselves even right let's say like d3m module of maker dow would want to vote the race to be a bit higher now whether they participate in that themselves or not that's a separate question right we don't expect core maker governance to vote and it probably one of the sub dow so like core units as they call them now right but this is the thing is that extra bootstrap module extra incentive module to funnel liquidity differently the system has been live since mid-december and as Mikhail said, the TBL up until a week ago was kind of tiny to care about it, right? As actually interesting integrations pop up, as Mikhail said also, people now actually start to notice it. Uh, the TBL probably needs to be a bit higher for that to make sense, but it's already pretty interesting. And we see with curve gauges, right, how interesting they are. Curve gauges, all of these bribing markets, right, CRV incentives, they created dozens of protocols around this model. There, the gauges are focused on incentives as emissions. In Gearbox case, it's not about emissions, it's about fees. So the logic of every week you vote, uh, whether you change your vote or not, that depends, right? That logic is somewhat similar, but the outcome is different that you don't em- emit and inflate. You bill less or you bill more. Because if integrations are interesting by themselves, where yield comes from outside, you don't need to give more, right? 
that's the thing with Gearbox. It's not about leverage here. Sorry, I'm mixing a few things up. They make sense in my head. Maybe they don't in yours. So stop me at any point. Uh, leverage can be achieved from multiple ways. You have perpetuals, you have synthetics, right? You have some other derivatives, you have looping on lending protocols, or you have margin. Gearbox is margin. Um, put safety aside, they are all different ways to get to similar exposure at the end. Let's say you want to have exposure to real estate market in Spain. You can buy a house or a flat. You can buy a management company that services those that if the real estate market grows, it grows in value as well, right? And profits grow. You can buy some real estate index on the stock exchange. So different ways, different risk exposure as you go there. Similar exposure in terms of an asset at the end. A bit less, a bit more, right? Like ETFs uh, have the same thing. In Gearbox case, you get to it, we think, in a safer way and in a more composable way. If you want to have leverage restaken, if let's say an LRT is added to ABA later, you could loop as well, right? You can just do looping. With Gearbox, you do it differently. So different mechanism, similar exposure, different risk, for some less in their perspective, for some more. Uh, market rates converge to some extent in a way as well. But that gauges model is very interesting because it allows other protocols, not just people, to come into this market and incentivize it. So we allow for influx of exogenous yields into that system as well. Not just into integrations, but into gear economics too. So in a sense, because the product you want to offer is like composable leverage and composable leverage means many different integrations. Many different integration means many different interest rates, which co creates like a complex decision-making problem right now. Who is setting these interest rates? And and sort of your challenge starts to be that you are operating in a decentralized environment and how could you do it? Like either you could have some kind of fixed mathematical model that will work always. It's too early to have like a fixed mathematical model. You could have something centralized where like there's a bunch of community members known that are there setting it. That could work if the community members are good, that could fail in, in, in various circumstances, the problem of centralization. And so the only actual alternative you are left with is kind of the gear token holders. It's like a decentralized set. In the beginning, probably it's like a smaller set of gear holders. So it be, it's kind of like behaves like a centralized mechanism because the number of holders is big, small. As time goes on, it becomes more and more decentralized. Maybe like that is the only alternative that is practically available for a decentralized credit leverage protocol. And we'll, we'll see, I guess, like how, how well that mechanism works. Yes, and just to talk a little bit more about this game in terms from the mass point here. It's a quite interesting here why we ask gear holders to set up these fees. We definitely try to solve the optimization mass problem. Just imagine you are a gear holder. And of course, it means that you want to maximize protocol fees. It's a quite simple. How you can maximize protocol fees? We take a cut from the interest rate. So if we can really set up the interest rate multiplied to the size when people borrow, we can maximize protocol fees. So it's all natural for all gear holders to maximize the metric, which is fees based on this interest rate multiply the debt from the whole protocol. If gear holders would be dumb, they maybe set up this interest rate too high, but the debt will be lower and multiply each other, they will be a little bit lower than it could be. So it's a simple optimization problem and gauge is solve it. So basically you are really involved as a gear token to set up this really uh, interest rate in a range which allow in gauges to maximize fees, which is good for the protocol, 
because you are a gear holder. So it's a really good feedback from the fees and so on. And I definitely believe it's a good mechanic. It's a good game. And of course, people should learn it. They should understand and we should it should take some time, of course. It's a quite novice. Nobody uses it, so we have no expectation how fast it could be adopted. But I think it's a very good connection between your action and protocol fees. I think, Meher, as you said, uh, it's similar to, let's say you want to do a fundraise, right? You can just open a free ICO contract, let's say legally, if you were able to, right? Open ICO contract, say supply is fully circulated, everything is out there, go have it, right? fully free market, nothing absolutely hidden, full unlocks at the start for everybody. I'd say like a full on free market, I don't believe in any levers and pulls, right, and whatever. Or you could try to do funding routes with C, deliver more, right, and try to make the valuations higher. End of the day, you end up on a free market. End of the day, you end up with full circulation. It's just that it's the path to that, right? Anything relevant enough and large enough will end up with the free market. But at the beginning, having some not control rather, but having some mechanism in place that help bootstrap might be a good thing. Uh, but as you said yourself, it will result probably once it's big enough in something a bit more uh, model-like. Maybe, maybe not. Cool. So we are at the end of the hour. I had a bunch more other questions because it's, it's such an interesting new protocol, new De DeFi uh, primitive, but time short. So maybe... Would you like to tell our listeners about if they are in, if they're more curious about Gearbox, what are the best sources that they can go to to understand the protocol, understand how they could participate, understand how could they could buy tokens, etc. I think the best way is to understand Gearbox, go to github.com slash gearbox protocol. It's the best way to understand. <laughs> or either scan and go to the contact sources, but for all other sources of information, Ivan can add. <laughs> yeah, sure. So for developers, there are dev docs. Uh, there is GitHub, of course, with all the code open. And we also have a risk framework. So essentially, it shows protocol updates, time lock, anything related to transactions and security. We have like a dashboard where you can see many of these things. So for developers, that might be quite interesting. Uh, for community and the DAO, I think a few interesting things that we do is we do monthly reports on how much has been spent on, on what. So for pretty much almost three years at this point, there are reports on how much the DAO spent on what, where the money goes. So the usual worry of DAOs is not persistent here because it's not a huge one, right? So there are not many like managers trying to skew a piece to take it off. So you can see it all openly. And yeah, Discord, Telegram, Twitter, we are 24-7 terminated on online. Cool. It was nice to chat with you, Mikhail and Ivan, and best of luck for, well, for the next next year, the next crazy year. Thank you, Meher. Cheers. Thank you, Meher. Great interview. Thank you, sir.